Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapters 15, 16, and 17 Chapter 15 I did not start in search of Jim at once, only because I had really an appointment which I could not neglect. Then, as ill luck would have it, in my agent's office I was fastened upon by a fellow fresh from Madagascar with a little scheme for a wonderful piece of business. It had something to do with cattle and cartridges and a Prince Ravanalo something, but the pivot of the whole affair was the stupidity of some admiral, Admiral Pierre, I think. Everything turned on that, and the chap couldn't find words strong enough to express his confidence. He had globular eyes starting out of his head with a fishy glitter, bumps on his forehead, and wore his long hair brushed back without a parting. He had a favorite phrase which he kept on repeating triumphantly. The minimum of risk with the maximum of profit is my motto. What? He made my head ache, spoiled my tiffin, but he got his own out of me all right, and as soon as I had shaken him off I made straight for the waterside. I caught sight of Jim leaning over the parapet of the quay. Three native boatmen quarreling over five annas were making an awful row at his elbow. He didn't hear me come up, but spun round as if the slight contact of my finger had released a catch. I, I, I was looking. He stammered. I don't remember what I said, not much, anyhow, but he made no difficulty in following me to the hotel. He followed me as manageable as a little child, with an obedient air, with no sort of manifestation, rather as though he had been waiting for me there to come along and carry him off. I need not have been so surprised as I was at his tractability on all the round earth, which to some seems so big, and that others affect to consider as rather smaller than a mustard seed, he had no place where he could, what shall I say, where he could withdraw, that's it, withdraw, be alone with his loneliness. He walked by my side, very calm, glancing here and there, and once turned his head to look after a city boy fireman with a cutaway coat and yellowish trousers, whose black face had silky gleams like a lump of anthracite coal. I doubt, however, whether he saw anything, or even remained all the time aware of my companionship, because if I had not edged him to the left here, or pulled him to the right there, I believe he would have gone straight before him in any direction till stopped by a wall or some other obstacle. I steered him into my bedroom, and sat down at once to write letters. This was the only place in the world, unless perhaps the Walpole Reef, but that was not so handy, where he could have it out with himself without being bothered by the rest of the universe. The damned thing, as he had expressed it, had not made him invisible, but I behaved exactly as though he were. No sooner in my chair I bent over my writing-desk like a medieval scribe, and, but for the movement of the hand holding the pen, remained anxiously quiet. I can't say I was frightened, but I certainly kept as still as if there had been something dangerous in the room, that at the first hint of a movement on my part would be provoked to pounce upon me. There was not much in the room. You know how these bedrooms are, a sort of four-poster bedstead under a mosquito net, two or three chairs, the table I was writing at, a bare floor, a glass door opened on an upstairs veranda, and he stood with his face to it, having a hard time with all possible privacy. Dusk fell, I lit a candle with the greatest economy of movement, and as much prudence as though it were an illegal proceeding. There is no doubt that he had a very hard time of it, and so had I even to the point, I must own, of wishing him to the devil, or on Walpole Reef, at least. It occurred to me, once or twice, that, after all, Chester was perhaps the man to deal effectively with such a disaster. That strange idealist had found a practical use for it at once, unerringly, as it were. It was enough to make one suspect that maybe he really could see the true aspect of things that appeared mysterious or utterly hopeless to less imaginative persons. I wrote and wrote. 
I liquidated all the arrears of my correspondence, and then went on writing to people who had no reason whatever to expect from me a gossipy letter about nothing at all. At times I stole a sidelong glance. He was rooted to the spot, but convulsive shudders ran down his back. His shoulders would heave suddenly. He was fighting, he was fighting, mostly for his breath, as it seemed. The massive shadows, cast all one way from the straight flame of the candle, seemed possessed of gloomy consciousness. The immobility of the furniture had to my furtive eye the air of attention. I was becoming fanciful in the midst of my industrious scribbling, and though, when the scratching of my pen stopped for a moment, there was complete silence and stillness in the room, I suffered from that profound disturbance and confusion of thought which is caused by a violent and menacing uproar, of a heavy gale at sea, for instance. Some of you may know what I mean, that mingled anxiety, distress, and irritation, with a sort of craven feeling creeping in, not pleasant to acknowledge, but which gives quite a special merit to one's endurance. I don't claim any merit for standing the stress of Jim's emotions. I could take refuge in the letters. I could have written to strangers, if necessary. Suddenly, as I was taking up a fresh sheet of note-paper, I heard a low sound, the first sound that, since we had been shut up together, had come to my ears in the dim stillness of the room. I remained with my head down, with my hand arrested. Those who have kept vigil by a sick-bed have heard such faint sounds in the stillness of the night watches, sounds wrung from a racked body, from a weary soul. He pushed the glass door with such force that all the panes rang. He stepped out, and I held my breath, straining my ears without knowing what else I expected to hear. He was really taking too much to heart an empty formality, which to Chester's rigorous criticism seemed unworthy the notice of a man who could see things as they were. An empty formality, a piece of parchment. <laughs> well, well. As to an inaccessible guano deposit, that was another story altogether. One could intelligibly break one's heart over that. A feeble burst of many voices mingled with the tinkle of silver and glass floated up from the dining-room below. Through the open door, the outer edge of the light from my candle fell on his back faintly. Beyond all was black. He stood on the brink of a vast obscurity, like a lonely figure by the shore of a sombre and hopeless ocean. There was the Walpole Reef in it, to be sure, a speck in the dark void, a straw for the drowning man. My compassion for him took the shape of the thought that I wouldn't have liked his people to see him at that moment. I found it trying myself. His back was no longer shaken by his gasps. He stood straight as an arrow, faintly visible and still, and the meaning of this stillness sank to the bottom of my soul like lead into the water and made it so heavy that for a second I wished heartily that the only course left open for me was to pay for his funeral. Even the law had done with him. To bury him would have been such an easy kindness. It would have been so much in accordance with the wisdom of life, which consists in putting out of sight all the reminders of our folly, of our weakness, of our mortality, all that makes against our efficiency— the memory of our failures, the hints of our undying fears, the bodies of our dead friends. Perhaps he did take it too much to heart. And if so, then, Chester's offer. At this point I took up a fresh sheet and began to write resolutely. There was nothing but myself between him and the dark ocean. I had a sense of responsibility. If I spoke, would that motionless and suffering youth leap into the obscurity— clutch at the straw. I found out how difficult it may be sometimes to make a sound. There is a weird power in a spoken word. And why the devil not, I was asking myself persistently while I drove on with my writing. All at once on the blank page, under the very point of the pen, the two figures of Chester and his antique partner, very distinct and complete, would dodge into view with stride and gestures, as if reproduced in the field of some optical toy. I would watch them for a while. No, they were too phantasmal and extravagant to enter into anyone's fate. 
and a word carries far, very far, deals destruction through time as the bullets go flying through space. I said nothing, and he, out there, with his back to the light, as if bound and gagged by all the invisible foes of man, made no stir and made no sound. CHAPTER Sixteen. The time was coming when I should see him loved, trusted, admired, with a legend of strength and prowess forming round his name as though he had been the stuff of a hero. It's true, I assure you, as true as I'm sitting here talking about him in vain. He, on his side, had that faculty of beholding at a hint the face of his desire and the shape of his dream, without which the earth would know no lover and no adventurer. He captured much honor and an Arcadian happiness, I won't say anything about innocence, in the bush, and it was as good to him as the honor and the Arcadian happiness of the streets to another man. Felicity, Felicity, how shall I say it, is quaffed out of a golden cup in every latitude, the flavor is with you, with you alone, and you can make it as intoxicating as you please. He was of the sort that would drink deep, as you may guess from what went before. I found him, if not exactly intoxicated, then at least flushed with the elixir at his lips. He had not obtained it at once. There had been, as you know, a period of probation amongst infernal ship-chandlers, during which he had suffered, and I had worried about—about uh, about, um, my trust, you may call it. I don't know that I am completely reassured now, after beholding him in all his brilliance. That was my last view of him, in a strong light, dominating and yet in complete accord with his surroundings, with the life of the forests and with the life of men. I own that I was impressed— but I must admit to myself that, after all, this is not the lasting impression. He was protected by his isolation, alone of his own superior kind, in close touch with nature, that keeps faith on such easy terms with her lovers. But I cannot fix before my eye the image of his safety. I shall always remember him as seen through the open door of my room— taking perhaps too much to heart the mere consequences of his failure. I am pleased, of course, that some good, and even some splendor, came out of my endeavors, but at times it seems to me that it would have been better for my peace of mind if I had not stood between him and Chester's confoundedly generous offer. I wonder what his exuberant imagination would have made of Walpole Islet, that most hopelessly forsaken crumb of dry land on the face of the waters. It is not likely I would ever have heard, for I must tell you that Chester, after calling at some Australian port to patch up his brig-rigged sea anachronism, steamed out into the Pacific with a crew of twenty-two hands all told, and the only news having a possible bearing upon the mystery of his fate was the news of a hurricane— which is supposed to have swept in its course over the Walpole Shoals a month or so afterward. Not a vestige of the Argonauts ever turned up. Not a sound came out of the waste. Finis. The Pacific is the most discreet of live, hot-tempered oceans. The chilly Antarctic can keep a secret, too, but more in the manner of a grave. And there is a sense of blessed finality in such discretion which is what we all more or less sincerely are ready to admit. For what else is it that makes the idea of death supportable? End. Finis, the potent word that exercises from the house of life the haunting shadow of fate. This is what, notwithstanding the testimony of my eyes and his own earnest assurances, I miss when I look back upon Jim's success. While there's life, there is hope, truly. But there is fear, too. I don't mean to say that I regret my action, nor will I pretend that I can't sleep of nights in consequence. Still, the idea obtrudes itself that he made so much of his disgrace, while it is the guilt alone that matters. He was not, if I may say so, 
clear to me. He was not clear. And there is a suspicion that he was not clear to himself, either. There were his fine sensibilities, his fine feelings, his fine longings, a sort of sublimated, idealized selfishness. He was, if you allow me to say so, very fine, very fine, and very unfortunate. A little coarser nature would not have borne the strain. It would have had to come to terms with itself, with a sigh, with a grunt, or even with a guffaw. A still coarser one would have remained invulnerably ignorant and completely uninteresting. But he was too interesting or too unfortunate to be thrown to the dogs, or even to Chester. I felt this while I sat with my face over the paper, and he fought and gasped, struggling for his breath in that terribly stealthy way in my room. I felt it when he rushed out on the veranda, as if to fling himself over, and didn't. I felt it more and more all the time he remained outside, faintly lighted on the background of night, as if standing on the shore of a somber and hopeless sea. An abrupt, heavy rumble made me lift my head. The noise seemed to roll away, and suddenly a searching and violent glare fell on the blind face of the night. The sustained and dazzling flickers seemed to last for an unconscionable time. The growl of the thunder increased steadily while I looked at him, distinct and black, planted solidly upon the shores of a sea of light. At the moment of his greatest brilliance the darkness leaped back with a culminating crash, and he vanished before my dazzled eyes as utterly as though he had been blown to atoms. A blustering sigh passed. Furious hands seemed to tear at the shrubs, shake the tops of the trees below, slam doors, break window panes all along the front of the building. He stepped in, closing the door behind him, and found me bending over the table. My sudden anxiety as to what he would say was very great, and akin to a fright. "'May I have a cigarette?' he asked. I gave a push to the box without raising my head. "'I want—' want tobacco he muttered i became extremely buoyant just a moment i grunted pleasantly he took a few steps here and there that's over i heard him say a single distant clap of thunder came from the sea like a gun of distress the monsoon breaks up early this year he remarked conversationally somewhere behind me. This encouraged me to turn round, which I did as soon as I had finished addressing the last envelope. He was smoking greedily in the middle of the room, and though he heard the stir I made, he remained with his back to me for a time. "'Come, I carried it off pretty well,' he said, wheeling suddenly. "'Something's paid off. Not much. I wonder what's to come.' His face did not show any emotion, only it appeared a little darkened and swollen, as though he had been holding his breath. He smiled reluctantly, as it were, and went on while I gazed up at him mutely. "'Thank you, though. Your room. Jolly convenient for a chap badly hipped.' The rain pattered and swished in the garden. A water-pipe, it must have had a hole in it, performed just outside the window a parody of blubbering woe, with funny sobs and gurgling lamentations, interrupted by jerky spasms of silence. "'A bit of shelter,' he mumbled, and ceased. A flash of faded lightning darted in through the black framework of the windows, and ebbed out without any noise. I was thinking how I had best approach him. I did not want to be flung off again, when he gave a little laugh, no better than a vagabond now. The end of the cigarette smouldered between his fingers. Without a single, single, he pronounced slowly, and yet he paused. The rain fell with redoubled violence. Some day one's bound to come upon some sort of 
chance to get it all back again. Must, he whispered distinctly, glaring at my boots. I did not even know what it was he wished so much to regain, what it was he had so terribly missed. It might have been so much that it was impossible to say. A piece of ass's skin, according to Chester. He looked up at me inquisitively. "'Perhaps, uh, if life's long enough,' I muttered through my teeth with unreasonable animosity. "'Don't reckon too much on it.' "'Jove! I feel as if nothing could ever touch me,' he said in a tone of sombre conviction. "'If this business couldn't knock me over, then there's no fear of there being not enough time to—to to climb out, and—' He looked upwards. "'It struck me that it is from such as he that the great army of waifs and strays is recruited.' the army that marches down, down, into all the gutters of the earth. As soon as he left my room, that bit of shelter, he would take his place in the ranks and begin the journey toward the bottomless pit. I, at least, had no illusions, but it was I, too, who a moment ago had been so sure of the power of words, and now was afraid to speak, in the same way one dares not move for fear of losing a slippery hold. It is when we try to grapple with another man's intimate need that we perceive how incomprehensible, wavering, and misty are all the beings that share with us the sight of the stars and the warmth of the sun. It is as if loneliness were a hard and absolute condition of existence. The envelope of flesh and blood on which our eyes are fixed melts before the outstretched hand and there remains only the capricious, unconsolable, and elusive spirit that no eye can follow, no hand can grasp. It was the fear of losing him that kept me silent, for it was borne upon me suddenly, and with unaccountable force, that should I let him slip away into the darkness, I would never forgive myself. Well, thanks once more. You've been uh, uncommonly— Really, there's no word to— uncommonly. I don't know why, I am sure. I'm afraid I don't feel as grateful as I would if the whole thing hadn't been so brutally sprung on me. Because at bottom you yourself— he stuttered. Possibly, I struck in. He frowned. All the same, one is responsible. He watched me like a hawk. And that's true, too, I said. Well, I've gone with it to the end, and I don't intend to let any man cast it in my teeth without, without resenting it. He clenched his fist. There's yourself, I said, with a smile. Mirthless enough, God knows. But he looked at me menacingly. That's my business, he said. An air of indomitable resolution came and went upon his face like a vain and passing shadow. Next moment he looked a dear good boy in trouble, as before. He flung away the cigarette. "'Good-bye,' he said, with the sudden haste of a man, who had lingered too long in view of a pressing bit of work waiting for him. And then, for a second or so, he made not the slightest movement— the downpour fell with the heavy, uninterrupted rush of a sweeping flood, with a sound of unchecked, overwhelming fury that called to one's mind the images of collapsing bridges, of uprooted trees, of undermined mountains. No man could breast the colossal and headlong stream that seemed to break and swirl against the dim stillness in which we were precariously sheltered as if on an island. The perforated pipe gurgled, choked, spat, and splashed in odious ridicule of a swimmer fighting for his life. "'It is raining,' I remonstrated. "'And I—' "'Rain or shine,' he began brusquely, checked himself, and walked to the window. "'Perfect deluge,' he muttered after a while. He leaned his forehead on the glass. "'It's dark, too.' "'Yes, it is very dark,' I said. He pivoted on his heels, crossed the room, and had actually opened the door leading into the corridor before I leaped up from my chair. "'Wait!' I cried. "'I, I want you to—' 
I can't dine with you again tonight, he flung at me with one leg out of the room already. I haven't the slightest intention to ask you, I shouted. At this he drew back his foot, but remained mistrustfully in the very doorway. I lost no time in entreating him earnestly not to be absurd, to come in and shut the door. CHAPTER Seventeen. He came in at last, but I believe it was mostly the rain that did it. It was falling just then with a devastating violence which quieted down gradually while we talked. His manner was very sober and set. His bearing was that of a naturally taciturn man possessed by an idea. My talk was of the material aspect of his position. It had the sole aim of saving him from the degradation, ruin, and despair that out there closed so swiftly upon a friendless, homeless man. I pleaded with him to accept my help. I argued reasonably, and every time I looked up at that absorbed, smooth face, so grave and youthful, I had a disturbing sense of being no help, but rather an obstacle to some mysterious, inexplicable, impalpable striving of his wounded spirit. I suppose you intend to eat and drink, and to sleep under shelter in the usual way, I remember saying with irritation. You say you won't touch the money that is due to you. He came as near as his sort can to making a gesture of horror. There were three weeks and five days' pay owing to him as mate of the Patna. Well, that's too little to matter anyhow, but what will you do tomorrow? Where will you turn? You must live. That isn't the thing, was the comment that escaped him under his breath. I ignored it and went on combating what I assumed to be the scruples of an exaggerated delicacy. On every conceivable ground, I concluded, you must let me help you. You can't, he said, very simply and gently, and holding fast to some deep idea, which I could detect shimmering like a pool of water in the dark, but which I despaired of ever approaching near enough to fathom. I surveyed his well-proportioned bulk. At any rate, I said, I am able to help what I can see of you. I don't pretend to do more. He shook his head sceptically without looking at me. I got very warm. But I can, I insisted. I can do even more. I am doing more. I am trusting you. The money, he began. Upon my word, you deserve being told to go to the devil, I cried, forcing the note of indignation. He was startled, smiled, and I pressed my attack home. It isn't a question of money at all. You are too superficial, I said, and at the same time I was thinking to myself, well, here goes, and perhaps he is after all. Look at the letter I want you to take. I'm writing to a man of whom I've never asked a favor, and I'm writing about you in terms that one only ventures to use when speaking of an intimate friend. I make myself unreservedly responsible for you. That's what I am doing. And really, if you will only reflect a little what that means— He lifted his head. The rain had passed away. Only the water-pipe went on, shedding tears with an absurd drip-drip outside the window. It was very quiet in the room, whose shadows huddled together in corners, away from the still flame of the candle, flaring upright in the shape of a dagger. His face, after a while, seemed suffused by a reflection of a soft light, as if the dawn had already broken. Jove! he gasped out. It is noble of you! Had he suddenly put out his tongue at me in derision, I could not have felt more humiliated. I thought to myself, serve me right for a sneaking humbug. His eyes shone straight into my face, but I perceived it was not a mocking brightness. All at once he sprang into jerky agitation, like one of those flat wooden figures that are worked by a string. His arms went up, then came down with a slap. He became another man altogether. And I had never seen, he shouted, then suddenly bit his lip and frowned. What a bally ass I've been, he said very slow, in an awed tone. You are a brick, he cried, next, in a muffled voice. He snatched my hand as though he had just then seen it for the first time, and dropped it at once. 
why this is what i you i he stammered and then with a return of his old stolid i may say mulish manner he began heavily i would be a brute now if i and then his voice seemed to break that's all right i said i was almost alarmed by this display of feeling through which pierced a strange elation i had pulled the string accidentally as it were i did not fully understand the working of the toy i must go now he said jove you have helped me can't sit still the very thing he looked at me with puzzled admiration the very thing of course it was the thing it was ten to one that i had saved him from starvation of that peculiar sort that is almost invariably associated with drink this was all i had not a single illusion on that score but looking at him i allowed myself to wonder at the nature of the one he had within the last three minutes so evidently taken into his bosom i had forced into his hands the means to carry on decently the serious business of life to get food drink and shelter of the customary kind while his wounded spirit like a bird with a broken wing might hop and flutter into some hole to die quietly of inanition there this is what i had thrust upon him a definitely small thing and behold by the manner of its reception it loomed in the dim light of the candle like a big indistinct perhaps a dangerous shadow you don't mind me not saying anything appropriate he burst out there isn't anything one could say last night already you had done me no end of good listening to me you know i give you my word i've thought more than once that the top of my head would fly off he darted positively darted here and there rammed his hands into his pockets jerked them out again flung his cap on his head i had no idea it was in him to be so airily brisk i thought of a dry leaf imprisoned in an eddy of wind while a mysterious apprehension a load of indefinite doubt weighed me down in my chair he stood stock still as if struck motionless by a discovery you have given me confidence he declared soberly oh for god's sake my dear fellow don't i entreated as though he had hurt me all right i'll shut up now and henceforth can't prevent me thinking though never mind i'll show yet he went to the door in a hurry paused with his head down and came back stepping deliberately i always thought that if a fellow could begin with a clean slate and now you in a measure yes clean slate i waved my hand and he marched out without looking back the sound of his footfalls died out gradually behind the closed door the unhesitating tread of a man walking in broad daylight but as to me left alone with the solitary candle i remained strangely unenlightened i was no longer young enough to behold at every turn the magnificence that besets our insignificant footsteps in good and in evil i smiled to think that after all it was yet he of the two of us who had the light and i felt sad a clean slate did he say as if the initial word of each our destiny were not graven in imperishable characters upon the face of a rock end of chapters fifteen sixteen and seventeen